I, as a squad leader, shouldn't ideally be shooting that much, and I should be more marking. So a lot of times, my first six, eight, ten rounds would be tracers, so I could mark targets for my squad. So I get up, and as soon as I get up into that corner, into that firing position, I catch two guys with Soviet block medium machine guns running up this little canal line that runs north away from us. So there's trees and foliage. I guess that they were about 300. So I put my, you know, tip of the chevron, put my 300, wow, and I fire, and it's a tracer. You know, I told my guys, hey, I got two. Tracer hits it like just below his feet. So I shifted up to four, wow, folded them. Boom, he goes down. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Ryan Rogers, a Marine Corps NCO who led Marines during the Battle of Marja, aka Operation Mushtarik, which was a huge and intense International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, offensive in Helmand Province, Afghanistan in 2010. It involved 15,000 Afghan, American, British, Canadian, Danish, and Estonian troops, and the largest joint operation of the war up to that point. The purpose of the operation was to remove a Taliban stronghold from Marja, thus eliminating the last stronghold in Helmand Province. This was Ryan's first experience of intense combat, and we spent significant time on the fighting, which began literally after stepping or falling off the Chinook on the LZ. Many don't know this about me, but the Battle of Marja had a profound impact on me personally in 2010 as I read about it in my time between the Army and the CIA. It was a primary reason that I found myself back in action at the CIA later. And I touch on that a little bit at the beginning of this podcast. After his intense combat experience, Ryan turned to drinking, as many do, but then found his path and purpose, writing the book, The Lions of Marja, about his experiences and those of his fellow Marines during this battle, and co-hosting the Choices Not Chances podcast. This is a great one. I don't usually tear up during an interview, but this one had me and Ryan in tears at one point, talking about the relationships created downrange, and I know y'all are gonna enjoy this. Ryan, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. Absolutely, I'm excited to be here, honored. Um, I appreciate you having me out. And you've got a great name. So uh, having, having Ryan as the name is a great starting point for us, but That's right. I did want to, I wanted to kick off here with um, just a, a touch point on Marja, which we're going to talk a lot about later on. But for people who've listened to me for a while, I don't think I've ever really talked about this on air, but um, they know that I got out in 09 after coming back from Afghanistan. And Marja was a huge, huge point for me in joining the agency later because I was sitting in the private sector in 2010, reading about Marja and how I was just sitting there going to barbecues on the weekend and playing golf while guys like you were downrange again. And even my guys were back in Afghanistan that year mm. and it just tore me apart. So I've always, always wanted to have someone on who has experience in Marja. So I'm just so thankful that we connected, Ryan. So I'm really looking forward to this, man. Yeah, Ryan, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, I look forward to talking about it and, um, you know, just getting into it, sharing it, sharing to people that want to know the emotions and want to know the mindset, uh, you know, of different things, uh, of different battles. I'm yeah. all about it. And I wanted to kick off here with, you, you've got your own podcast, right? So it's Choices, Not Chances. Yep. Can you share why did you come up with that name for it before we dig into more here? Uh, sure. So, you know, my partner, Matt Charette, he's my co-host. Um, he was my APL downrange in Marja and a man by the name of Gordon Emmanuel was our lieutenant, our platoon commander. And it was, it was out of one of his, you know, famous little safety briefs that he would give. And he was more stoic than maybe he would, uh, openly admit but he would always talk about how it's the choices that we make not the chances that we're put in or the chances that develop so if you want to have good uh, outcomes you need to make good choices if if you make a bad choice you're going to have a bad bad outcome so regardless of the chance whether you're in combat whether it's in business and relationship in your personal life if you're setting yourself up setting your shot up to be a good choice for a good outcome that's likely what's going to happen but if you fly by the seat of your pants you get over emotional 
uh, and you make a bad choice, then stand by. You're gonna you're gonna reap that too. So yes. we wanted to, you know, make a nod to to you know to that to that in and of itself. Um, but that's the, that's really the point I want to drive home. You know, the, the my podcast is about um, bridging the military civilian divide and giving the information openly out there to the people that want it. Uh, about combat about combat stories from the horse's mouth from the guys that were there and um and talking about the choices they made choices through transition good and bad choices you know a lot of guys get stuck in transition and so um being that that was the basis of it was trying to get vets and and people of my community to make better choices um it, it was fitting so that's where it comes from. Yeah. So that's probably the only time I've heard somebody say that they were using something that came out of a safety brief because maybe the <laughs> Marines do it differently because those army safety briefings are notoriously bad. Yeah. It just uh, depends on who you got, I guess. <laughs> All right. That's good to hear, man. It was usually, it was usually, uh, you know, like an R rated script, um, but not from him. He was, that's why I say is more stoked than, than you'd put on. So that's awesome. All right. Um, I, I want to touch briefly, we had mentioned uh, before we hit record, you're uh, from the Ohio area, and I want to jump back to maybe maybe using this choices, not chances, as we look at you as a kid and some of the decisions you made and what you spent your time on, what would that mm -hmm. have looked like back then? You know, I came from like a middle class family. I, I recently uh, shared a post on my LinkedIn uh, that somebody else had put out there that you don't see commonly, um, but it was like, you know. I didn't want for, I didn't want for anything. And that's what the post was about. It was like, I was a silver spoon kid with a good upbringing with religion and both parents in the home all the way through high school and, you know, together. And I didn't want for anything. Um, but in the post too, is like, at some point you got to add some adversity in your life and not be afraid to leave the shore, um, uh, and go find what you're, you know, supposed to be. But Growing up was heavily, heavily involved in hunting and fishing. Uh, so my dad didn't play sports when he was in high school. Um, he hunted and fished and trapped and, and was an outdoorsman. And so I heavily inundated with that. I think I shot my first shotgun at like four years old. And so it was a big 2A <laughs> family, you know, uh, conservative values, though, um, big on the country and nationalistic pride, even from some of my youngest days, you know, like I remember that. So um where'd that come you, from in the family i don't know uh, i've racked my brain on it um unless there's people doing things that i don't know about inside my family which is you know whatever but uh yeah i don't know my dad was always like that he was always very proud very american very conservative and and um it's not like he went around talking about politics and politics was never on the tv in my house it's not wasn't a thing um but I think conservative, um, you know, Protestant values align with, you know, a certain sect of the country and, and, and you know, more than more than the other. But, you know, like even to this day, my dad's an auctioneer and I, I would come home on leave or whatever. And he'd be holding up like an American flag, you know, portrait that somebody had done for auction. And like he would recite the entire preamble, you know, like to. And my dad's not that person. Like he didn't serve. Um, now, now some of the influences in his life when he was younger were in Vietnam. And I don't know if maybe that, maybe he's seen this, you know, side of that. Um, and then my great grandfather. So his grandfather was in world war II as an army medic. Um, yeah. and so there was that, but he, my great grandfather was so old when he passed and I was so young, there was never for me, but from my father, probably there was some stuff there. Um, and my mother, the same way she was, you know, they were very, you know, in lockstep with how they raised us. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I, I, I boggles my mind too. I don't know where all it comes from, but it was real. And it's still to this day, you know, more now that they've had, you know, a couple sons go down range and, um, the, oh, the a couple national. of you have gone down a couple of you yeah, my little brother right? lucas uh it was in the national or yeah was in the national guard i think he's done with his time now but he went to he was at bagram for for uh, for a you know a stay and 
and then and then myself i went on uh, multiple deployments so they, they've been through that side of it and and once you're a parent on that side of it your nationalistic pride goes through the roof because you got skin in the game you know so um did they want you to go that route no no uh -uh, not in the beginning it it wasn't like yellow ribbons around my tree um you know i i think they knew it was going to happen after 9-11 that was kind of a catalyst for me uh joining like i had always been into army men and ghillie suits and going out and shooting i was a real good wing shooter because i grew up pheasant grouse rabbit you know doing those things um i was a bow hunter and so anything bigger, you know, deer and bigger, it was like in my household, you weren't a man if you didn't use a bow. So we didn't gun hunt for big game. We bow hunted, which, you know, say what you want. I was never in a rifle scope, but it's a lot the same with lining, you know, your front sight tip of your, of your actual sight for your compound bow inside your peep sight, making sure it's centered kind of, you know, that, that all correlates to scope shadow and and everything and then the moving your sights towards the strike of the round the whole thing is is identical so i think that helped me you know out later but um yeah i i guess i kind of got lost where we were going there that i was asking yeah how they felt about you signing up and like most marines i've talked to i think just first, scared. It sounds like not super happy yeah yeah i think when i came home and said you know i wanted to go to the marines they had known I think they had known since 9-11 that, and that was two years prior that I, that that was where I was going. I was, you know, posters were up and bracelets and keychains, the whole nine and, uh, always watching, you know, what the Marines were doing in Iraq on the TV and Afghanistan on the TV for that whole two years felt like forever. Uh, but once they realized I was serious and like, we could sign for him now, or we can make him wait till he's 18, they opted to make me wait hoping you know that it would change and it didn't so once i turned 18 i went on uh an elk hunt out west with my dad and then came back depped in shipped out but my mom was real crushed about it um my dad was i don't know how he felt on the inside after i was gone but he was man about it like took me down there and tried to prepare me mentally and uh mom not so much she, so did she come around Oh yeah, she was there and and they both came to graduation, which was great. And I came home, like all that was great, but she wasn't happy, you know, and not only the Marines, I elected to be an infantry guy. And so in the middle of a war, I get it. It's, that's not ideal. If you're a parent, I'm a parent now. I don't want to hear that, you know? So, um, <laughs> though, though I think I might. So, um, Dang. yeah. Um, why the Marines though? Mm, I just want to be the best. I think they're the best. I still think they're the best. I think that for regular infantry, I don't think anybody has a regular infantry that matches us, even, even within our own country, you know? Um, and I don't know. I'd rather, I'd rather die than somebody tell me, you know, I was weak or joined something. I want to go all the way up. If I'm going to do it, let's do it. And the blues look better. I mean, that was a selling point for sure. It's just a, you know, better looking uniform to me. It's true. And, uh, I don't know when I thought of like, who's the biggest, baddest, toughest group of fighters that will give me an opportunity to have at least some personal retribution against, you know, against these assholes for nine 11, then that was the Marines. That's the quickest way. No, so, that's why how uh you find yourself down range pretty quick don't you i mean <laughs> the op tempo was high when i came in yeah so um but but you know i went through security forces first and so that was a little bit i was a little bit behind my like my peers that went to the regular infantry out of boot camp what uh, security or, forces so the main job, they're actually like, like a tier two, I think a tier two uh, asset, but not really. Like it's like a trap team. Um, so we would act as like a quick reaction force for Southeast Asia's embassies. And so you have a trap mission uh. at an embassy. You have a platoon of guys that's heavily uh, focused on CQB and like takedown of, of, of an objective building. 
And so like <laughs> when you're in fast, you're in a platoon size element, you get like something like a battalion of infantry battalion, thousand people's ammo allotment for that platoon. And you go to like HRP and defensive driving, you go to Hearst masters, at, uh, advanced urban combat school with live shoot houses there in Chesapeake. It, it's a, that's awesome. It's, it can be really good if you have the right command structure. And I happen to have a great command structure. So, um, and, and we did, uh, we did a uh, Cuba, we deployed to Cuba and we did a refuel defuel security mission, uh, for some submarines in a place and then we did cuba and then we did um we were qrf in bahrain for southeast asia's embassies yeah man that's did you have to self-select into that i mean it sounds a you bit choose more to go to yeah. well you choose to go to security forces i think there's a little bit more of a background check that goes maybe so much waiver not so much waivers are going to get through um but unless you're like presidential security uh at camp at camp david they get real selective then with their security forces, but for fast, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I did, didn't seem like it, but I tested high and everything high enough to go do other things. Um, so when I said infantry, he's like, okay, how about this? You'll get tons of weapons training before you go. And I was like, ah, oh, that's good. And, and it worked out. It, it was one of those weird things where I was butt hurt because I realized that I wasn't going to combat. Yep. But it paid dividends later when I went to combat. Yeah, the amount of training that you just talked about that you got had to have been so helpful for later on. Oh my God. And I had just like, shooting. Any, well, when you go to fast, you don't always, it's like hit or miss if you're going to get a good command structure because, and I don't know if it's still this way, but it used to be like a, a, a Pogue MOS, uh, per, any personnel other than grunts, those of you who don't know Pogue. So, so somebody that's not infantry, like a supply guy, could take that as a B billet and come there and be a squad leader as a mm. sergeant or, you know, a corporal. And then you're falling in under this, you know, non grunt person for two years who probably doesn't think like you're going to need to be thinking when you get back to the fleet. For us, when I fell in, there was two drug pops in the most senior platoon. So my time at fast was cut by six months because they filled the gaps with me and my roommate, uh, Eric Chavez. So we fell in on a senior platoon when everybody was senior to us. So it was like, you're not going to take a team. You know, all these guys are there. But the good thing was um, two of the NCOs, one was an 0311, one was an 0331. So there you get your machine guns and your, and your straight leg grunts. The other one was, um, I believe, a supply guy, but he was locked on, like really, really good. Uh, and the other two kept him where he needed to be for us. Then our platoon sergeant was uh 0369 uh coming out of out of recon i think he was over in rip at the time and then uh our an 0302 uh captain in charge of the platoon and they got after it i mean they let us play hard and we did play hard but we trained hard hard we always rucked every 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 field up i mean we we're in the field every week um and we usually get like a decent weekend for being out all week but we trained hard and then like you said we got, we got so many schools uh so many schools stupid amount of rounds to train with um so everybody was cross trained on the 50 the mark the 240 uh headspace and timing and everything so all the 0311s coming out of there going to the fleet were like that's that's not a thing over there and it's usually not a thing in fast but we had a machine gunner squad leader who was like no you're gonna know when you go back they're not going to stigmatize, you know, because there's a stigma if you're in fast when you come back to the fleet. It's like you've you, been out of it for a while. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know your tactics. You've been out of it. And uh, that may be true for like uh, Banger guys, Banger Washington and Kings Bay, Georgia. They have like, you know, a different mission there where they don't get access to the field and, and stuff. But for guys that came, at least when I was in fast, everybody out there was banging. Uh, cause, cause all the squad leaders in the leadership of us knew where we were going. So it's like, yeah, we could take a vacation and that might not be good for them because they're definitely going and we might be the ones taking them, you know what yeah. I mean? So it was a uh, very heavy training, um, all the way through. And like I said, we did a little work up, went to Cuba and we did eight months as like a fence line tour. And, uh, that's not cool. Um, <laughs> 
there's nothing sexy about it. You know, there's nothing, there's no great stories from it. You know, like you're a single Marine in an 80 foot tower by yourself for eight hours a day with a pair of big, you know, binoculars, like tourist binoculars. And you look at a mirror post doing the same thing, looking at you all no day long. Way. It's terrible <clears throat> for morale. Like they have, they have a nightlife and some bars and stuff. So you would do like 10 days on the fence line and then come off and have 10 days off. Five of that was training, but then they'd give you four or five to, you know, R and R do what you want kind of thing. So they had a couple bars there and there was a like permanent personnel army, you know, this is there. In, Cuba. So they, in Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with kids. And so okay. it was, it was not a great, you know, but one, once again, it was one of those deployments to break in and see some things and uh, learn and train. We trained the whole time we were there too, in the salt flats. Um, I think we caught hurricane Katrina on the back end, which was cool. Had to come down out of the 80 foot towers into like a storm shelter, but not good. Only so Marines think that's cool. Yeah. Just a quick word from our sponsor, NordVPN, tied in with one of our own combat stories, and we'll get right back to the show. When I was flying Apaches for a deliberate operation in combat, it was my responsibility to keep our ground forces safe. One night while covering a third Special Forces group hit, we identified insurgents moving on our Green Berets on the ground. We cleared our fires and took care of the threat. I never wanted our brothers on the ground to wonder if we had their backs for security. From when I was at the CIA until today, whether I'm at home or somewhere else in the world working or browsing the web, Looking at my banking or buying something online, I need someone else to protect me, which is why I use NordVPN. NordVPN secures my online activity on a regular basis. It disguises my IP address and allows me to access content I might not be able to from my normal location and even get better prices on some websites by coming in from another location. It'll scan downloaded files for viruses, block phishing, and malware-ridden websites and is the fastest VPN out there. Please head over to nordvpn.com slash combat story and grab your exclusive NordVPN deal. If you go to nordvpn.com slash combat story, you get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And now, back to our combat story. We come home from that and then, uh, you know, run right, right back into our workup. And then uh, the next one is Bahrain. We're like, nobody's done anything ever uh, from fast. And then we get over there and we get a mission. So uh, that was cool. That was 06, 07 time frame when Israel and Hezbollah were launching rockets at each other. There's a bunch of American citizens uh, there in Lebanon. And so you know, we were living it up. We're in Bahrain. We had a softball team, like a league. <laughs> We, we would train hard, but, you know, we played hard. And when there wasn't a mission, it was like there's only so many times you can, you know, I think it was like once a, I don't know, at least once a month, but probably like once every couple of weeks, they would they would hit the thing. We'd have to pack up and palletize and be ready in 60 minutes. And then it was always nothing, nothing, nothing. And then, uh, and then it was something. And talked about Lebanon and Israel. They were about to go at it. Hezbollah's, you know, going at it. Rockets are coming into Lebanon and we need to get these Americans out. So we took, um, we palletized everything. We took C-130s to um, a British Royal Air Force base in Cyprus. It's cool. A little, little island in Cyprus I didn't even know existed, which was awesome. And then while they staged the whole thing in communication with the MU. Uh, we were able, you know, you still have to PT, you know, so we'd get up in the mornings and you're running cliffside of the Mediterranean. Nobody gets to do that, man. People that's don't awesome. talk about like that stuff. And that's the stuff I, I like talking about that stuff because like jumping into the Mediterranean off one of those cliffs, I free fell for four seconds. I think it was something like 80 feet. And, uh, and it's, you float really, really, uh, you're super buoyant because of the salt content in the ocean over there. So you don't even have to like hold your breath and you float. So that was kind of weird. Um, and then we did our mission, you know, uh, like a squad from our platoon took, um, I think they were 53s. They took them in to, you know, they weren't sure if they were going to have to resecure something at the time or just plus up. I think the Mew had landed some some regular infantry guys, maybe Eighth Marines, or I'm not sh sure exactly who it was that was already there, but it was seamless. Got there, um, transferred American citizens and their families. Uh, the Mew had commandeered like a a, fa a big old ferry boat and like a cruise liner. Just like took them, <laughs> got the people off of them. 
brought them and then we and then we put guns on them big guns and we went like the team that went in through the choppers had they didn't want an american face on it so they were like in polos and khakis with sea bags full of weapons come you know like to go in so that was just kind of trippy and you then, guys uh, too you y'all were dressed like <laughs> all that? the marines that went over in the yeah. helicopter were like that uh i came afterwards and my our my job for my guys was to get i think it was a 50 i think it was a 50 tripod mounted up on the ferry boat and on, on a couple places and then, That's then wild. Ush, yeah we ushered the people back uh back across to cyprus and it was crazy because when we got to cyprus there's like cameras were everywhere news media and it was like there's no longer not an american face on it you know yeah it was people knew and what was crazy about that is like i evacuated people from my hometown from columbus ohio uh i evacuated two girls that were bartenders at a bar i frequented when i was in high school it's wild and they were in lebanon yeah weird right um two boys from uh two brothers they had to be like 20 25 uh they were from new jersey and they said they literally never left their zip code in their whole life but their grandfather was ailing and wanted to see them before he died so they went over there and a rocket hit the neighbor's house they were like scuffed up they were like we're never leaving jersey again dude ruined them uh, so there was like you know we got to it, it was a cool um humanitarian feel good make you feel like you're yeah you're actually helping somebody kind of deployment uh which was cool and you know we finished that back over in bahrain and, and then rotated home we so. were I, I was in germany at that time and they tried to spin us up our apache or not our I, some of the air assets there and had us plan a route down to cyprus to see, just in case anybody mm. needed it and i think as marines were moving in just because we were forward deployed. wild and it was we never ended up doing the flight but doing the flight planning like through italy we were all just so stoked and hoping this would work out we're like we'll go to cyprus we'll be right off the coast this would be great yeah uh, but it, it didn't work great. out so i'm jealous man that's really cool it was great look i tell a lot of people we got to spend just a little tiny bit of time in lebanon and a little tiny bit of time over in cyprus but great people beautiful people yeah um you know kissed by the sun that they, they all got they're, they're just all beautiful and they had great food um there's a lot to love about that place if it wasn't yeah. war torn you know yep. every few years so so yeah that I, was a good one i wanted to ask you you know you had mentioned growing up shooting and especially the bow um and you got a lot of training with your initial unit selection but mm. As you transitioned from civilian into the Marine Corps, how much did that shooting that you had done as a kid help or hinder you? Like I, I've heard some guys say you have to unlearn some of the things you grew up doing, but other people have said it was a huge benefit. So for me, I never shot a pistol once before I went in the Marine Corps. I might have shot you know, like an old revolver when I was small, but I never shot and learned how to shoot a pistol, but it's much the same. Like I didn't. I, I assume it helped me. I never, I never qualified under expert. I was many times the range high at whatever range I was going to. Um, I never had a problem shooting. So I assume it helped because I watched a lot of guys struggle and just not understand. I, I find sh I, it's hard for me to answer because it's so second nature to me. Like I shoot, even now I shoot all the time. I, I, I'm, I volunteered my VFW. We built a pistol range at it. Um, I'm always out there clinking, you know, and I shoot uh, God, probably a couple of days a week. It's so second nature to me. It seems so simple. I don't understand where people struggle with it. Now, maybe when you start talking about scopes, it gets a little bit more technical. Uh, but even like an RCO, as long as you dial it in, I mean, you put the, you know, I don't know. It just seem, it seems like yeah. everybody should be able to shoot to me. I, I don't understand the breakdown. Well, I didn't grow up shooting and it was never – you know, I could train myself on it, but it wasn't second nature. And actually mm. one of the guys we had on Bob Keller, a Delta, former Delta operator, he was saying, you know, he, he grew up shooting, then he went in and they taught him how to shoot. And he kind of had to unlearn a little bit of that to get back to the basics, you know, and maybe it's because it. we, maybe it's because I never shot rifles. I mean, I just didn't, I shot the bow. I understood center scope, center peep, can't have room. 
level. Like breath like work I, has to be huge for a breathing bro, I would is, imagine. Breathing is another big thing. And so like, and, and maybe it's because like I had really great instructors in boot camp and a really great experience in SOI and tons of shooting and, and fast. And so like I started shooting as a kid and then it never, like it never let up. Every unit I went to, we just continued to shoot a shitload. Yeah. And so that's why I say I don't, I just don't ever remember struggling from from boot camp on, I never struggled to hit the target. So, and you end up, I guess, uh, just timeline wise, first time you find yourself downrange, can you give us an idea like which, uh, which combat theater were you in and what years and what uh, unit? So, I don't consider the Lebanon thing combat. When we went in, we seen some tanks that weren't ours. Uh, we seen some smoldering buildings. You know, yep. we seen the aftermath of combat on some of the people we evacuated, but but not combat. I deployed to Iraq with three two Lima Company next, and um, I would say that's probably my first combat. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't combat. It was pop shots and IEDs at that point. Um, what was the there, mission set for that one, Ryan? Yeah, it, it was just after um, Steel Frist and Iron Curtain, which were two huge operations in the Alkheim region to kind of pacify them. And so by the time I got there, um, like you could let vehicles through your foot patrol and there were certain rules and they had kind of pacified that area. Uh, so I think it was more of presence, um, making sure we we're saturating the area with our presence still. Uh, but also we were helping stand up the, uh, the Iraq, you know, the IAs, the Iraqi army, and then the, the, uh, Iraqi civil order police, I think they called them. Um, I think it was something like that, but they're police. And so a lot of our efforts were spent, you know, communicating with their tops at the police station, trying to facilitate their resourcing and pay their people. And like, I didn't do that, but I was the transport you know and it was all on foot uh for for me i was on foot on that on that deployment um so just a lot of patrolling which was great like i said it was a shitty deployment i was butthurt coming off of it because i seen little to no combat um but it's the first time i was in country in an area where people were were not nice against us and there was you know con that constant threat i never had a close call outside of like id strikes at the end we had 207 millimeter chinese rockets come in on cop rawa and they they exploded just outside of uh you know one of our posts but not again nothing 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 crazy that didn't come until till the next one yeah i was gonna say i know we'll get into some of the crazier times but you mentioned you know you're a little disappointed that you didn't see combat just for people listening like can you talk more about that where that comes from I mean, if you train your, it's like uh, if you're a teacher and you, you always wanted to be a teacher and you graduate high school and then you take a loan out, you know, and you go invest in your future and you get that master's degree because it's not even like you can get a bachelor's degree anymore and be a teacher in most places, maybe in the South. So you get that master's degree and all that time training, and then you, then you become a teacher but it's like a teacher that has no contact with kids and you don't teach anything. It's like you set your entire life up to do this one thing. And then nobody ever lets you do that one thing you train for it and you dream about it and you think about it and you want it as weird as that is like, but that's what we are as Marines, as a grunt Marine, you want war. You want in modern day Viking, you want somebody to take the leash off and say, go get that. That's what you want. And very, a lot of people are under the impression that if you're in the Marines, you went down range and you saw combat. It's just not the case. A lot of Marines that were in the infantry didn't see combat a lot. And like, I didn't even realize that until later in life, you know, how many people had seen, you know, full on combat and, and it's not a gouge. I'm not taking a stab at anybody, but it's like, I think there's a misconception that every Marine goes down range and yeah. does you know, sexy hits and, 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 and deployments like that. And the fact is, it's just not, it's not the case. And it weighs and on so, them too. I think the way you're talking about, like for those who have been in and didn't have that chance, it's, 
It's a oh, I have friends that you know, for one reason or another, landed in units that just kind of skipped yeah. around. No, it's no fault of their own. You know? Oh, it's but just... there's like serious depression that comes from it in the yeah. aftermath. Like guys that feel like they never got to prove themselves. Because if you're there, that is the ultimate arena. That is the arena, the gladiator arena that that um, that we have today. The ultimate arena is war. And when you're a type A person that's given your entire life uh, to a war fighting organ organization to go down range and you know and stack bodies and then you never get to do that oh and by the way a bunch of your friends have and so how does that supposed to make somebody feel um they shouldn't feel any kind of way they should feel I, i'm glad they didn't because now they don't have to deal with anything uh you know negative that maybe could come um but i do understand it because i felt that way coming off my 07 deployment like man i'm never gonna i chased it my entire career and i'm never gonna get it uh, so it's a, that's a weird feeling. Yeah. It's, it's weird to tell people about cause people don't want war, uh, generally. So. Do you, do you think that it's, I, I mean, you, you want the war, but if you broke it down more, is it, you wanted to test yourself against someone else. You wanted to just be somewhere like that with the guys that you've trained alongside for so long, like, as you take it a level deeper. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, for me, I loved it. I was built for that job. You know, that's the way I fancy it. And uh, maybe not because I didn't make it all the way. But uh, <laughs> but I was, you know, I, I thrived in the chaos. So I, I think that had I never got it, I would have I would have serious problems, uh, like rationalizing the time spent, the practice. And the thing is, like now in my life, it's like you have the best military in hopes to never use it. You know what I mean? That's the way you should think about it. But when you're the 20 year old guy or 21 year old guy, that's leading a squad. You don't want them thinking that. Nope. You want it's them thinking as soon as the, as soon as the leash is off yep. wide open, you know? So, Oh God. Yeah. So, so we'll transition here to Marja. Um, and I'm again, so excited to dive in. I wanted to ask about the book, right? So you, so you wrote lines of Marja. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just before we, now, I'm going to ask you to set the stage in a minute for what that operation was. And, and I want to spend just a lot of time here with this. Um, but I also wanted to ask what made you write the book before we get through all the story? The, the sole reason that this book is, is even a thing is um, that's what it looks like. But when I pushed, when we pushed Marja, um, we were helicopter company. So it was like, you're landing in the middle of a city and then three battalions or four battalions where the people are going to push everybody from the outside directly to us. It was going to be a fire sack with us in the middle of the fire sack. Knowing that, you know, you're not going to see like <clears throat> your packs and shit for a while, which turned out to be true. So I packed one book, pretty thick book, and it was Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell. Packed the book in my day pack, you know, with like grenades and claymores and we went in heavy and that's like the only creature comfort item I took. Cause I wanted to be able to read about what I'm doing from somebody who's already been there and have that fresh in my mind. I don't need to be thinking about other stuff. So I put that book in there and then, you know, you know, we drop into Marja and you're living in mud huts and the nighttime was kind of like the safe space because they, we owned the night. And they found that out pretty quick. And so you could a little bit, you know, halfway relax. And so by like, a, you know, a headlamp, I peeled through that book in like, <clears throat> I don't know, something like four days, something stupid. It was supposed to give me a couple weeks worth of entertainment, but, it, you know, a lot of radio watch at night and, uh, and reasons to be awake. So I peeled through it fast. And while I was going through it, you know, that story is an amazing story, first of all. But like, as I'm reading it, I'm participating in Mosh Tarak in the opening four days, which were wild, very wild. And it's like something in me just said, man, you'd better start writing shit down. And that's the moment, like right after I put that book down, uh, I have probably 10 right in the rain, you know, little books from that deployment that just have little stories written, little things that would impact me like on an emotional level i would write those down ops that were kind of crazy i would write down like the highlights and the dates 
I just wanted to have it. And then I started telling everybody, and that's the other reason the book's possible. I started saying it out loud, you know, and that's what a lot of people don't do. And if you never say your dreams out loud or like your ambitions out loud, then how could anybody that's in your circle ever hold you accountable? Right. So I said it to a lot of people, Hey, I'm writing a book about this. They start shit, you know, bullshitting around. Hey, <laughs> it's going to be a book. Then it's going to be a movie. This is who's going to act my part. Blah, blah, blah. It became like a thing, like a living thing. And, uh, and it just kept getting crazier. Uh, so the more, sh more shit went in the book. And then when I got home, you know, I was, I was pretty jacked up when I got home. Um, we can talk about that if you want later, yeah, but yeah, definitely. coming home was different and I uh, didn't focus on it um, for a couple of years. And then, and then it became a therapy. It became therapeutic to get those books back out and start crafting it. And, you know, I, I, it took me a little while to get clear minded and clear eyed after everything and, and, and be able to write it correctly from the right vantage point yeah and uh and so yeah i wrote like three quarters of it then i hit up uh matt charette co-host of, of the podcast and was like hey dude i need to read this over a period of like six or eight hours i got i got to read this and you got to make sure that i'm accurate and you were with me for everything so so we went through that process and that's then i awesome. put it through an editor and and now it's out there so that's cool um, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. I know for many, the idea of counseling is not something we want to talk about, but I hope that hearing the stories of these veterans, myself included, and our decisions to seek professional support will encourage others to do the same. I've used BetterHelp and found it an easy, convenient, and cost-effective way to get the mental health support I needed. In fact, later in this episode, Ryan and I tear up, and I was thinking this is the kind of thing I'll be bringing up with my counselor because it really hit home. And you'll see what I mean when we start talking about the bond between veterans. BetterHelp will assess your needs, and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. What's great is you can start communicating within 48 hours. And in fact, in my case, it took less than 24 hours. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash combat today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash combat. And now back to this combat story. So if, if you can, then Ryan, set the stage for people who have never heard of Marja, where it's at, the operation, and kind of why this thing was conceived to begin with. So, you know, some of that may be over my head. Some of it, I don't understand why it was conceived in the first place and after being there and then being hamstringed to do the things they said we were going to do. But be that as it may, I know that uh, in the 2009 time frame, uh, General Stanley McChrystal uh, was touring and he was in command. He was touring the area and he requested several thousand more troops and 30 or 40,000 more troops to go into Southern Hellman province. Um, and Southern Hellman province was the last uh, at the time, what was being preached as the last Taliban stronghold and Marja uh happened to be kind of the heartbeat of that a lot of opium and and poppy trade coming in that fuels the taliban's pockets um you got some borders right there of not friendly people that like us that can get in and out kind of quick and um you know i have my own thoughts i think that you know it a more advanced society like uh, one of their bigger cities um let's say Kandahar or whatever, it's a lot harder to control those people, I think, than it would be to control illiterate farmers. Um, and I don't mean to, you know, bash, but that's what the people were there. They were farmers. Some of them could write, some of them could read, some of them couldn't. Uh, not a whole lot of educated people in the area. And I think if you're the Taliban, um, you're going to have those people farm your poppy and farm your pot, and you're going to give them a little kickback and then take the rest of it. And if they have a problem, you'll kill them. Uh, and you can rule by the iron fist with people that are, uh, let's say, less intelligent. That's just my my take on it. But, but be that as it may, it was a Taliban stronghold. And the president thought about it. And then he said, yes, he granted the thirty to 40,000 troops to go in. And I had just transferred out of 3-2. Uh, uh, after we came home from from Alcom, I did a little stint on the boxing team, the all Marine team for like nine months, and then came straight off the boxing team 
to uh to three six and dropped into kilo company and that would have been like september october of 09 dropped to my platoon in like november start getting like helo dunk tank and stuff because we were slid right into the next deploying unit they had already done cacs and everything or you know their final exercises out on the west coast and uh so they slid us in and so i check in in like september and i'm going on pre-deployment leave for marja in uh, december uh and then coming back you know so and, it, you know, I guess it was just to break that stronghold, uh, I think was the big idea. And I, originally, I think we were going to destroy a lot of their income by destroying some of their fields and, and stuff. And, and along the ways, things change. But we, ha we had to we had to uh, stimmy that uh, the resistance and the Taliban strength they had there. Yeah, huge operation, as you were saying, like authorization at the highest levels um just quickly what was your role in that um rank you know like what what position were you you fill in at that point in time so so when i fell in i fell into kilo company second platoon and i was a sergeant and i took over a squad a situation where there was a workup and they were supposed to go on a mew on a booze cruise and everybody was all in and as soon as it changed to a main invasion a couple of the squad leaders that were there opted to not go on that deployment uh, because their time was coming up and they opted not to extend. And I picked up one of their squads. Did yeah. they ask you to come in and do that? Do you have a choice? No orders, not asks. Okay. I was, right. I was asking to be part of uh, uh regimental combat team sixes uh, PSD for, I, th I think it was Colonel Kennedy at the time, but a private security detail for him going back into Iraq. And they said it was going to happen. And then when this, you know, when this authorization from the president gets moved into place, they got to take the the next available unit. I'm sitting stagnant waiting for RCT six to stand up. And they're like, there's a squad leader sergeant that's just in limbo. Sucked me over. Yeah, because I was supposed to stay at three, two. And I got a call from the monitor like two weeks after I signed all those papers because I signed an op for uh, reenlistment to stay in operational forces this is a little bonus to it. And uh they called me like two weeks later and they're like, Hey, uh, things have changed. You're going to three, six tomorrow, have your stuff ready kind of thing. And so me and six or seven other NCOs from three, two, uh, chopped over there. Were you pretty excited about this chance? Super fucking stoked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like <laughs> super fucking stoked. Love as it. soon as they said it, I'm like, what do you mean? What's three, six doing? They're like, well, they're slated for a booze cruise, but there's things on the horizon and they need to plus them up. And I was like, what's on the horizon, you know? <laughs> uh, and I didn't find out what was on the horizon until I was already over at three, six. And that, that, okay. that, uh, thing came through. And like, I watched these, these other guys' eyes get big and say they were going to opt to get out. And I'm like, yes, I'm yeah. taking yours. So, uh, give me your dudes. I'll take them. So uh, if you can, Ryan, just before we jump into your experience there, could you give people an idea of the terrain? Cause I think, People who haven't been to Afghanistan have pictures of mountains, you know, desert, and they just don't know. So what was Marja like before we jump in? So it's a farming, it, it's a farming area. So it's, it's riddled with canals, both east and west and north and south, which provide a little bit of greenage, uh, foliage, foliage um, right on the canals, but it's mostly desert. It's mostly uh, desert with mud hut buildings. Um, sometimes you'd have like a city of 80 compounds, one of them named Shinny Wall from the book, all interconnected. One guy could move completely through these 80 compounds and never never be seen by the outside. Um, they had they had villages like that. Um, but but very desert like. Yeah. It, and, and when we got on the canals there was some there was some foliage oh poppy they had a lot of poppy uh fields and fields <laughs> of poppy so that's really pretty though i didn't know that till i got there when the poppy blooms it's it's, it's, it's actually a really pretty plant so uh that's cool yeah okay a lot of poppy. and then the last thing with uh you falling in on a squad right at the last minute after they've done a workup what was your relationship like with these guys having just come in before going down range yeah, so um, everybody's got to kind of do it on their own, I guess. The the, the way I, f I fall out, I want to know who, who knows what they're doing. Um, 
and I, I did it wrong in the past, falling in on squads at three, two, I, I, you know, kind of strong arm, but this is what's going on. This changes we're making. That's the wrong way to do it. In my opinion. Uh, so being more experienced and having a couple squads at that point, when I fell in, I just watched, I didn't announce I was taking shit over. They'd already been through a workup, but I had, I had combat experience and some of them did, some of them didn't. So yeah, I had a lot of shooting experience. I was tactically sound um, and proficient, but a lot of them, you know what? I got to give them a reason to trust me. They don't know me. I didn't work up with yeah. them. Their squad leader just bailed on them essentially. Uh, so there was a couple op you know, opportunities for me to train and hike with the guys before we left. Um, and so I try to carry as much as I could carry just to show them, a, give them a reason to trust me. And, and I was always very blunt with my guys from the very beginning. I always would have an in brief, like when I first took over, like, Hey, nothing's going to change. The squad is the squad. I'm just a person that, you know, that comes in and, and controls the levers. I understand you guys got a thing going on. Um, but this is what I expect from you in my squad now. And if you don't meet those expectations, I will have problems with that. And then what do you expect from me? And that was important on that one because they do have different expectations of me. I, they don't know me. And, uh, and so I, you know, I opened with that and it worked out. I think maybe for the first month or, or maybe 45 days of the push, um, or of the deployment, I probably micromanaged them, um, more than, more than necessary, but it was because I didn't know them either. And I needed to know that these things were done right because we were hidden all day long in the, in the sunlight hours. And so, but, but, you know, 30 days in, everybody's operating like a smooth oil machine, you know, everybody's got their roles, everybody. And, and so then it became spot check and stuff. And then the squad just became alive. It just became a thing. Um, yeah. So it, it's difficult checking in to people and deploying that quick. Um, yeah. If you do it wrong, it can be really bad. Uh, so I would just say that. Yeah. Oh man, that's interesting. Okay. Please take us through this. So uh, it, I think it's fantastic that you had taken notes on some of this. I kick myself for not <laughs> doing the same in my life. And I've talked to so many guys on this show said the same thing. Oh yeah. So great foresight in, in doing that, but take us like, that, that initial push as you're going in, how, how did it feel knowing like, Hey, they're about to drop us in the center of this thing. And they're I'm the wrong, them. I'm the wrong person to ask. I get asked that a lot. I was stoked. I was fucking yeah. punk. No, I that's was, what I want. Yeah. People need to hear that. Yeah. A lot of people like had nerves and, and I didn't, I was ready. I was ready to go. I mean, I'm sure there was a little bit of cautious you know feelings about my about my demeanor but um it's, i had been to so many dry holes in iraq that i still didn't believe it cia has given us a brief that never happened before in a dish dash in a turban that never happened in iraq he's uh -huh. doing it now and i'm like this you know i wanted to believe it but i also didn't want to buy all in and be crushed again i, I think subconsciously so i'm like yeah guys we're gonna be fine we're gonna be fine we're gonna it's, fine let's wait till we get there you guys are stressing about nothing you know and if it is then we'll, we'll light them up we'll stitch them up and we'll move about our day and then like i knew it was going to be real on the landing and uh, i talk a lot about it in the book our landing wasn't ideal we had trained on and off drills for two weeks you know straight <laughs> getting everything right you know and uh and then we go to the airfield and I never seen that many helicopters before in my life. I walked out to the airfield and the whole, the whole entire bastion side of Leathernecks airfield was full of helicopters of all different kinds, Blackhawks, 53s, 47s, um, medevac, Bur I mean, J they, Apaches, Blackhawk, or, uh, uh, Cobras, uh, Hueys. We had everything. When you say what, what they give you, they gave us everything. They gave us everything, at least for the first two weeks. We had everything. Anyway, I never seen that many birds in my life. And it was just like kind of breathtaking, like, holy shit. And all you see is just, you know, like it looked like something out of a movie. You just see, you know, hundreds of tacked up, rocketed up, machine gunned up dudes making their way onto birds everywhere. And it was actually, it was actually really awesome. I get cold chills talking about it because it's one of the so coolest I, sights man. I've ever seen, man. 
<laughs> it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. So um, we all loaded on the birds and uh, my platoon sergeant was on my bird with me and we had 56 people. So like my squad, uh, all of the fire support team, um, some engineers, you know, some EOD, we had a lot of people. And so he was at my right. He'd be the first one off. I'm the second one off. And so we get on this bird and you're uncomfortable. We all had a hundred pounds of ammo at least and grenades and explosives in our day packs. Nobody has, you know, heavy packs. That's all going to come to us later. It's all palletized. And so it was like things that go boom and, uh, in a book in my bag, but I I'm heavy. I'm, I'm hurting. And we did like lit, we did drills before we took off like the entire outfit every helicopter picked up sat down picked up turned sat down picked up like and i don't know if that's probably like just a pre-combat check or they're checking the weight to some degree there with that many you said 53 dudes were on well i think ours was a was an army chinook or 40 so it was a big bird but it was still a lot of dudes tacked up so that's a lot of people on a bird yeah yeah it was a lot so anyway we go don't quote me on the numbers. I'm pretty sure it was, it, it might've been 47. I think it was 56, 56, 46, something like that. Anyway, we go, finally, we like done with the checks and we pulled in and that's when it, like, that's when it became, okay, it's time to lock in. But it was hard because I never seen something more beautiful than pulling away from Leatherneck. And maybe it was just because of everything that was going on, all the chaos, all the commotion, But like, as we pulled away from Leatherneck, they don't have power like us. So the landscape of the, you know, the ground goes black. And then you see the Hindu Kush mountains way off in the distance and like a million times more stars than you ever see at home. Elevation, pollution. I don't know. I don't know what it all attribute to that, but it was beautiful. And it was like a calming, like, okay, we're doing this. Like, there's no going back. We're going to the middle of the city right now and it's on. And, um, uh, and when we dropped in, they landed us in a flooded poppy field. <laughs> His army bird sets down. Staff Sergeant right. Uh, Joe, right. Shout out. He, he steps off and goes straight to his knee and like sinking sand mud. I'm right in his back. And then like, however many guys on top of us, Oof. bird pulls off. And, and this is at night, Ryan, right? This is like three in the morning. Yeah. So are you guys all knotted up and yeah yeah, yeah so right. like in the book i talk about it like i had i had my gear down and i could not figure out what the debris was in the air because the chopper's setting down and it's going to blow some dirt and dust like check but there's shit going everywhere and i was like what and then it started hitting me and i'm like it's water what and it was so confusing in those few moments like what is this and then, I mean, this mud was so bad. I talk about it, like I said in the book, but the mud was so bad that I had a Marine almost die. Like he was almost to his face and going down because everybody come out in the same spot. We lost his pack. We never recovered his pack. Has a small rocket on it. Like we went out with metal detectors, couldn't find it. It just ate everything. The earth is weird. The other funny thing to note is that 10 feet in any direction, it was dry. Or let's say 10 meters, 30 feet in any direction in that field, completely dry. Here, I think that they had flooded the fields knowing we were coming. And yeah. the army landed us right in. Which, you know, they they mapped that out. I can't even be mad because their IED threat in the area was huge. Yeah. They didn't want to land on an IED. And so someone, you know, whoever from the J5 said, this is your spot, they're going to land right on that spot regardless yep. of if water's coming. So I get it, but it was real shitty. It was like 42 degrees out and, and sprinkling anyway. And so everybody was instantly wet, you know, (laughs) and the fun that comes with that. But as soon as they pulled away, I knew we were not in a dry hole. Like the bird goes up. And as soon as the bird goes up, I see red tracers and like different colored green tracers going through the sky. And I'm like, okay, they're here. That quick? that quick going up Dang. like we sat down now they didn't hit the bird i'm quite certain but i think they were just trying to say hey you know there's a bird you know i don't know yep. seeing the tracers i'm like oh shit okay and uh so now it's like i gotta unfuck this situation <laughs> uh, i got like six weapons that can fire including my own you know like 40 something that can't or if there was 56 obviously 50 if that number is right and it's like oh my god this is bad and you're trying to be quiet but you're trying to pull people out of the mud it's just not your textbook entry. And um, 
and and the IED threat was so big that the SOP was we were going to run a metal detector in front of everything. Well, in Afghanistan, they don't have a trash company, so there's trash everywhere, and every step is a beep 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 beep. beep. You know, it's like every direction is just all the trash and metal on the ground. So that made that difficult. Um, and then right there in the opening, I was trying to get it undone, talking to my point man about getting his uh, metal detector out getting oriented on the map to get to the foothold building. And uh, the arrow had his um, had his air radio on blast. What's the arrow and just for people? Our air officer, the guy that's going to call in fires, birds, if we need them, he's going to coordinate and deconflict all the air. And usually it's a pilot that's on the ground inserted with us as an air officer. Um, so they know the pilot's lingo. They know exactly yeah. what's needed, that kind of stuff. And uh, I felt bad for him. He was, in a, he, was in a, he was in a spot he didn't want to be in or didn't ever picture himself being in. And um, anyway, the, his, his chest rig was on blast for all my Lance Corporals to hear. The, uh, there was an AC-130 gunship that was circling overhead, and they were kicking out these big 55-gallon drums of IR illumination and like one drum lights up 700 by 700 meter square like daylight in your lenses and your nods i've, I've never, never seen, seen that i've never neither seen had that. i neither had i they, they dropped them all around the entire battlefield and the whole thing was just there wasn't in nods there wasn't an area that you could that wasn't lit up um which was super sweet uh <clears throat> and as they're doing that they call him and they say and like me a22 be advised you have a platoon size enemy element closing on you from the north they got rockets and machine guns prepare to defend yourself and i look down and like half my guys are weapons are done they're still trying to pull guys out so instantly i'm like hey sir as soon as that happens another lieutenant um we leave his name out but it's in the book and he cleared it so <laughs> i'm gonna tell the story anyway he's, he's in a bad situation too <clears throat> in his head um, because as soon as he hears all that, he's like, we're all going to fucking die. And yeah, yeah. Really? And uh, my platoon sergeant was like, what that? Shut the fuck up, sir. <laughs> and and that was over. But now wow. all my Marines are like, oh, shit. You Now they're getting a little, you know, hitching their giddy up. Like what? So I look over to the north and you see them. There's a whole like 25, 30 dudes just coming right at us. RPGs on their shoulder. And I'm like, fuck this arrow, spin it up. We need, we need skids and we're not playing this game. So he gets them up. They push from the IP just as they're pushing from the IP and he clears them hot. You're now you're talking like air coming in from their initial so, yeah, point that, coming was, in to take oh, a shot. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So they're going to hold in an IP, like in a holding in a holding zone. And then if Marines call and need them, they're going to fall out of that holding zone. And on the way you're giving them attack heading and you're giving them your entire uh, close air support request, which we have like formats for. And then the final thing they're going to ask you or that you have to authorize is saying you're cleared hot for them to come in and make that run. Well, just at that time, the point man of the suspected enemy platoon has an IR strobe flicker go off on his chest. Here, this is a Afghan National Army counterparts that were supposed to be coming from a different direction and were supposed to put their IR flicker on when they got on the bird, forgot. And, you know, when you're dealing with host nation, well, I forgot, we forget. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, we almost had an international incident in minute four because you forgot. But they were really good after that. But he forgot that. And so it was like, here comes the choppers and the arrows like abort, abort, abort. And they're boom, countermeasures coming out. And I'm just standing there like this, looking at my platoon sergeant's like, <laughs> what the fuck are we doing? And, uh, and uh, I learned a big lesson right then because I was frustrated. I was nervous. I almost killed these guys that were, you know, our counterparts. And I look at my platoon sergeant, uh, old Joe Wright, and he looks at me. He's like, so what, Rogers? So what? We have to lead them and we have shit to do. And it doesn't matter what gets in our way. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. So what? Get your shit ready. And like in that moment, that was a huge, a huge lesson. Because it does, when you were there, it doesn't matter. that Your ride just left. You need to figure it out right now, you know? And, uh, and so I, I try, to, I try cool. to say that about the opening because it was a big lesson. Damn. You know, following that, we, I don't know. After that, we, we patrolled and found our foothold. 
something like five in the morning, had to go back out and recover gear before sunlight came up. But at least we had the cover of machine guns set in and that was a little easier. Um, and then about the time the sun comes up, it was like the wild west. It was, it was insane. So take us through that first, you know, one of the first ones you can remember just, uh, so you're, you're in town, like where you're supposed to be. Theoretically, you've got a push going to drive the enemy towards you. You're clearing, I assume in a, in a certain direction. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, uh, I should have said this when we set it up. So my platoon's mission, we were going to land, we were landing as a company, um, three, four platoons in the company, get weapons for second, third, as we land, uh, our job is to make it to our foothold building, which we had our preordained where we were going to make that the most advantageous building on a, on a key intersection of uh, Route 608 and 605, which were, were the two main roads coming, feeding Northern Marja. We were going to hold that foothold because that foothold allowed us to control backfilling while the other platoon, one of the other platoons cleared the city of Shinnywall, which is like an 80 mud hut compound interconnected little village it's right in front of us from the foothold and we have elevated positions with guns snipers you know we have mortars rolling with us we had everything so we could support shutting down reinforcements a and then coming across and meeting them b but on that that road so if the road's here we have to cross about a 12 foot rushing 12 foot deep canal and there were ieds on it and so <clears throat> when the sun came up, you seen the jugs, uh, ammonium nitrate and aluminum was what they were using there. We called it anal. And, uh, and it was horrible that like they could flip set, they could flip six by M wraps with this stuff. Like it's 40,000 pound vehicle, you know? So it was nasty. And, in in you know, being around IEDs for so long, it's like, there was such an obvious one on top that we knew there had to be secondary tertiaries buried. You just don't do that. And when the sun came up, the command wire for the IED on top was running to the neighbor house right next to us. Um, so yeah, well, like once it was time to move, uh, e, e man, my, uh, my Lieutenant called me up. He's like, Hey, we need to set the APOBs and APOB is an anti-personnel obstacle breaching system. Um, that's a two backpack system. And when you open them up, it's got like, um, let's say engineer tape, but it's like 140 some like grenades, like frag grenades worth of explosives in that engineer tape. And they, you attach them together. So when you set it, it comes a little rocket. You point the rocket right where you want it to go. When you, when you pop it, you get like, I don't know, you get like seven seconds from the time the rocket takes off with, you know, stretching the line of of explosives out and then you got another like five seconds after land so you got like 15 seconds to get some cover which is good we're going to set that up shooting it right over the ieds hopefully it detonates the top simp that's anything that's buried below it and the idea is that you now have a three to six foot path of no ieds over that bridge or over that structure that you can walk so we set all that up well as we're setting that up um, we did two systems side by side. So three feet from this one, um, you know, that's going to make a path of three feet, three feet of this one and anything in between. So we get that set up. And just as we're setting up, I have two EOD guys out there with me because they're checking like the uh, structural integrity and the composition of the bridge, if it can even take this explosion. And then I have like a security team with me. And uh, as we're looking at that, the guys from the north taliban from the north just opened fire but that 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 rpg goes over our building that was the first contact it was that first morning and uh you know so we run back in and i always wondered how i would feel because even in iraq i didn't have somebody decisively engage me and like fight me uh so that was a fur and i wanted to be good you know i wanted to feel good about it but until it happens you don't know how you're going to react or how you're going to feel and i felt great and i ran ran my security team back in and there happened to be a like a um they had just harvested the poppy so then the poppy stems dry out well they keep all that for like kindling and stuff and they stack it i mean high and so the guy had a our foothold building had like a courtyard wall but it had a ramp literally of poppy stems stacked up going right up to like man size firing post in the corner which is probably what it was for them and so myself and um 
one of my saw gunners, a corporal named Corporal John Simmering, we we run up the poppy stems and we make that corner and he's got a squad automatic rifle, an M249. And I, as a squad leader, shouldn't ideally be shooting that much and I should be more marking. So a lot of times my first six, eight, 10 rounds would be tracers. So I could mark targets for my squad. So I get up and as soon as I get up into that corner, into that firing position, Simmering's right here on my right. I catch two guys with, you know, Soviet block medium machine guns running up this little, it's like a canal line that runs north away from us. So there's trees and foliage. And uh, I guess that they were about 300. So I put my, you know, tip of the Chevron, put my 300, wow. And I fire and it's a tracer. You know, I told my guys, hey, I got two. Tracer hits it like just below his feet. So I shifted up to four, wow folded him boom he goes down when he goes down and he went he went down but he didn't go down hard he like went down you could see tell he was messed up i pieced him up a couple more times boom boom and he went down for sure and when he was down for sure the other guy like dropped his gun and tried to run like he knew known that we had the dope on him and simmering hit him with like you know a 15 round burst out of that saw and stitched him up boom he folded so as soon as he folds and there's still shit going on everywhere <laughs> it seemed like so I traced that tree line. They had to be running somewhere that they considered safe. And so I traced the tree line up and at like 800, 900 meters, there's a house and they had five dudes, black mam jams, probably who was shooting at us in, initially, you know, with a big boy gun, they did launch some rockets. And at that time I was fighting this group back here. Our other squad had made contact with some of the, they were still clearing out these buildings that these command wires are running to, and then getting back, kind of northwest of my position and they were hitting a house over there and so there's multiple gunfights going on and uh so i elected to do a call for fire mission drop uh 60 millimeter mortars on these guys in the back and um though we didn't get it on on uh on target before they scurried and ran we got it real real close to them um dropped a couple 60 uh 60s back there um once we dropped the 60s, it, it, it quieted them down pretty good. Um, but the the other the other squad uh, was still fighting, and, and they ended up calling like a 500-pound bomb in. And once the 500-pound bomb hit, they didn't understand those weapons. They didn't want any of that. Um, they reduced a couple buildings with one bomb, had dudes in it. And once that happened, I noticed that in Marja about their fighters there. They didn't understand sniper rifles. They didn't understand like high Mars and long range rocket systems. And, and they were terrified of, of fixed wing aircraft. Not even at the end, they weren't even terrified of choppers. They shot one down while I was there, uh, lost two captains there. Um, but, but they didn't understand stuff that could reach out and touch them and just appear and, you know, and, and, and have that kind of devastation. So battlefield kind of fell quiet. You know, we had little pocket fights, um, little probing missions you know the taliban sent a couple guys out just to see our posture and we'd stitch them up too and then the night fell and once the night fell we really they they did understand that they understood that they didn't win that game uh like before we got there they understood yeah. they stayed away um one one thing to note about that first that first day things that like as a squad leader i didn't ever have on my radar um hypothermia I never had on my radar ever that mm -hmm. I'd have to deal with hypothermia. We're always in the desert. It's always hot. We're, you know, I never think about that. Although the desert gets cold and I know that just never on my radar. Yeah, I had a, it, that whole story I just told you from, you know, beginning to end is like eight, nine hours of fighting those pocket fights. It's not like this was all at once. This, the beginning was all loud. Then there would be a lull. Then there'd be a fight. Then there'd be a lull. Then there'd be a fight. And when you're doing that in pockets, like platoon size pockets, we had a lot of platoons out there. So all day long, there's, you know, guns, gunplay going on and bombs and, and the whole nine. So it wasn't always, you know, just real quick and, and done. And, and the reason I say that is like, so throughout that whole day, we had built a fire in one of the mud huts that was a warming room because guys were freezing and like the, there's some videos of it online. I, I'll show you later, uh, but you'll see that my guys is, pants would be ripped from their dick to their ankles so wide open 
And it's, you know, from the mud, the mud ripped them up, pulling them out of the mud, ripped their clothes off of them. Well, nobody brought extra pants with them. We we're supposed to open a ground line of communication in less than three days. That didn't happen and get new gear. And so my guys were cold, even in that first one. We come into that foothold building. Everybody had like f- fucking press camis on. And we look like we just crawled out of hell, completely <laughs> soaked, completely full of mud. <laughs> and they're like, how'd y'all's drop go? You know what I mean? Like better than yours um and yeah so we had to pull marines down another thing that's never on my purview was adrenaline um never before had i seen a marine be in a fight and have such an adrenaline cocktail dump that about 20 minutes into it he's like i gotta i gotta sleep i got like all right sit really down, yeah. give him 10 15 minutes of a power nap and then they, they could come right back to it but multiple times in hairier situations where that cocktail was releasing i had marines that were extremely fatigued extremely fast because of all of that you know what was going on so so those are two things in that opening day that were um that opening you know first light that were not on my i wasn't looking for didn't yeah. have experience with would have never thought you know i have corman coming up hey, saying hey dude we need to start a fire these some of them are too cold like what <laughs> start a fire yeah like no clue um but all my marines acted like men they acted like marines nobody pulled out nobody you know pissed themselves nobody cried um there was definitely shocking on a lot of people's eyes you know there was a select few of us that were like fuck yeah you know and that was the (laughs) older guys you know that have been chasing combat your whole career finally got it right um you know and then it got dark and e-man was like let's remind him that we're here and so we blew those apob shots uh simp deaded just like it was supposed to two ieds that were buried was that a massive just massive explosion right really bad and like um so when we when we pop smoke i just turned around hauled ass and there was like the other end of the canal so i like dove down in there was i dove down in there my team leader in the and E-Man and the platoon commander are kind of watching this from an angle. And the explosion was so big that they thought maybe we died in the explosion. They were like, oh my God. And then like we come, I don't know, there's like two of us, me and a security Marine or me and two security Marines. We come crawling up like, hey, it worked. And they were like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's push, you know? So um, it was, it was big. I, the only louder explosion than that I've ever heard was out training out at uh 29 palms and cacs when they when they actually detonate a bangalore charge and it feels like the earth picks up and sets down from itself um but that one was a pretty big one and so it was after that we moved through we metal detected um um you know like through an open step into shinny wall where the command was and that that was day one we bed it out and then the next morning it was you know, more of the same moving. And, and it's that type of tempo daily, kind of like the sun comes up, you're getting it, getting after it. Night after, fall, after morning prayer. Yeah. The sun would come up, Hada, you'd hear the prayer go off. You know, I imagine they prayed and had tea, probably washed their hands and their ears and then came after us. Like, I, I think that was the morning routine, at least for like a week, at least for a week. And then we had killed a lot of them in that week um as like a total unit in marja yeah. a lot of people died in that first week that that came after us um you know were there particular days there that were harder than others that you think back on like don't know how we made it out of that or i can't oh, believe yeah. i had to put these guys through this yeah i mean every day um <laughs> in the beginning it was every day it was gunfights all day um it was the only time i'd ever ran low on ammunition as a squad on that deployment um so so let me walk you through a couple days so that that happens the next day our main mission as the platoon after shinny wall was cleared and we protected their clearing of shinny wall where to meet up but our main objective was a meb objective marine expeditionary brigade objective one or two and it was a main bomb maker and Taliban facilitator in the area. And he was supposed to be at a land bridge three clicks from where we put in at that foothold building. 
and we had to fight all three clicks to get there we we're supposed to click have all that done in 24 hours it took us three days to get the you know the first day was there night in shitty wall the next day is only it's from from shinny wall to the land bridge is only a click and a half you can see it but we've never been there before we're looking at you know we're looking at maps and stuff but we're not exact because they tell us you know you should be looking for a command center so okay we got to look for oe antennas we got so that second day um the platoon that was out in front of us to the you know out in front of us from shinny wall uh they had got heavily engaged as soon as the sun came up and uh it was like something out of a marine recruiting commercial like we laced up inside we got order of movement and then we started filling out of the compound we were in as a platoon banging left and going straight to the chaos and like the closer we got <laughs> we picked up the pace and now we're like four or five hundred meters out from like connecting friendly uh with a friendly line with a friendly connecting file so that we can get our eyes actually on the battlefield and like we give the signal to to pick it up so now we're like in a tactical column but everybody's at like a medium pace jog bringing it in and then we come up to these buildings um, at the back end of Shinny Wall, we come up into these buildings, file through friendly lines and into the point of the whole company. Um, and we take this wall. And uh, there's a great video. I had an embedded reporter with me, uh, CJ Shivers of the New York Times. Great, great guy, great coverage. He was a former Marine, uh, knew what he was doing. Um, and he fell in with my squad as we moved through that connecting file and got a great uh you know six minute video of a six hour firefight kind of thing but it it's it's on youtube it's called the inches that matter and uh if you check that out it'll give you a real good um baseline for what the scenes look like you know where the where the enemy was coming from and to but we make it up to the point of this wall and i got my whole squad on this wall and this wall is like three foot of you know 30 inches of hard packed mud nothing can get through it we can't even hit them with at4s and lulls and blow through them so great firing position and uh there's a great firing position position to the east and it had like a knee-high wall that came out here that you could fire to the south and conveniently that's where the enemy was at that time and so we started hammering them um they try to refill through rat lines and we'd we'd pile them up uh we had one machine gunner who was an a and a guy firing a 240 bravo from the kneeling and i watched this happen like i was giving him an ad rack because i seen a rat line where they were just flooding out of like six seven hundred meters out and he takes a position on that knee high wall and comes up to a knee and just i mean just stitches up a whole it was like a, a grazing fire almost like he had he's at about four feet and they're all in a line coming down this rat line to jump out and he just <laughs> peels them Jeez. um and that was uh, that was pretty amazing to see like uh and be a part of but at, after that whole thing subsides to the south they start dropping their weapons and moving because they know our ttps they know our so or our uh, rules of engagement our roes and so as we're not able to shoot them coming across they get over here and they kind of get to our direct east and when they got to our direct east i had a bunch of marines laying out on that knee-high wall firing south and then we start taking rounds this way so they did a little like a little Aussie peel out of there. And um, and th that's when I uh, my first Marine got hit. I had uh, Travis Bacolo, Lance Corporal, Saul Gunner. He was up on that wall, kind of like this with his arm over the wall. And uh, we had known that they had a sniper out there and he was masking his fires with small arms, which was genius. It, 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 it like got me like, oh, he's not stupid. Yeah. Like they, yeah. they're not stupid. And uh, and then boom, he got hit. But it was a through and through through the shoulder um he he got hit and he didn't even know he was hit his, he thought his team leader slapped him and told him to scoot down the wall a little bit and then he felt the you know the cold blood you know the cold wind hit his blood he's like oh i'm wet oh i'm hit and as soon as he gets hit i'm running over i'll make sure he's okay doc's patching him up real quick and it's chopped up in the video it's not you know the video i told you about it's a little chopped up um so it didn't happen exactly like that and and cj did that because as soon as my guy got hit my squad lost it for like you know 2.5 and just put a wall of lead uh down range like at the cyclic rate screaming and and and, and saying things that you know <laughs> shouldn't go on that video and uh, <laughs> as soon as that was all over and he got patched up you know 
the fight was raging and I had called up I made a mistake there, a purposeful mistake. I called him up urgent surgical, um, which when you call in a, you know, when you're calling a nine line in to get a guy off the field, that's what you call in. If, if it's immediate, he needs to be priority. I selfishly wanted to get my Marine off the field and put that in and I shouldn't have done that. So, uh, I was because I was, what, because you're risking like, well, if somebody else is gravely, well, if somebody else is gravely wounded and he's got a through and through, through the shoulder and they're hitting the femoral or God forbid the head or neck or chest area, they need to get to the next echelon of care right now, not yeah. later. And so I could have potentially pulled that from somebody, but it all worked out. They came in zone. Uh, they picked up, they picked up V. Um, and it was crazy because they were shooting rockets at birds. <laughs> They were shooting RPGs at birds and so much so that when I pop smoke, actually the back cover of the book is me popping smoke. For uh, that's cool. It's like you're throwing it to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's the bird that came in afterwards yep. uh, to, to land on it, but, uh, it popped smoke and, and, uh, Vicola looks at me as a bird lands. He's like, I don't want to get on the bird. Cause they just shot a bunch of RPGs. I'm like, you're getting on the bird. Uh, so, so you got on the bird and, um, that's i mean that's just how it stayed day two let, let me ask you something real quick ryan just before you jump to the next day here um so you, we know that you join after they've done the workup right you meet mm -hmm. these guys you're mm -hmm. new i think many people have heard about the bonds that are created between like combat <laughs> veterans right mm -hmm. your day two of some pretty intense fighting at what point do you guys get to that you mentioned like he gets hit and you guys are just kind of lose it for a minute laying down fire because you're just pissed At well that's gonna happen you that's gonna happen anyway them? i think but uh, you know i don't know when it happened i think it happened in the very beginning but the first time i noticed it i think we were mm, it was real close to the 21st um probably the 20th we invaded on the we invaded on the 13th, so seven days. Um, we were at another position after we had taken the bridge down, figured that whole mess out. Um, we were in a situation where one squad lived on this side of the street, one squad lived on this side of the street, and then I was living with my squad up at like this other compound because we had had an emergency airdrop of water come in for the whole company it happened to come close to my compound. So I had to stay there until it was divvied out. So the guys had moved down to the objective site. We were up here. So you didn't see your friends every day. You didn't like the, the best friends of this squad that has the best friend yeah. in this squad. They didn't see each other, but there were still ops and fighting going on every day. And uh, I write about it in the book and it always messes me up to talk about it because it's probably, you know, like next to the love that you have, <clears throat> sorry, next to the love that you have for like your children or your spouse yeah. or, 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 you know, like your blood relatives, it is the strongest emotion I ever felt in my life. But whew, we're sitting up on a machine gun post or my, my buddy was, and I was bringing water from that, <clears throat> from that position I was in down to their position. And, uh, you know, my guys hadn't seen their friends in a while. I hadn't seen my friends in a few days. You know, I say a while. It seems like forever when there's yeah. six gunfights in between. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so even though it was only a few days, that, that's the way it was. And <clears throat> so when we brought that water down, it's like, okay, now we're going to consolidate. Let everybody say, hey, what's up? You know, smoke a cigarette together. Uh, that morning, they actually had chow for us. We hadn't eaten either. We ran out of food and water um pretty early because because like i said we were supposed to take things down much sooner than we did <clears throat> anyway i show up with like i don't know a thousand bottles of water we got like a donkey like rigged up with poncho liners full of <laughs> dude we figured it out so we come cruising in and my, my homie herbie machine gunner he's already got posts up guns up the whole nine he's like what's up dog he hands me a newport we start this new port up, got the guys counted in the guys are going to their thing. He's got like a big bowl of food. They went and raided the bazaar and found chicken eggs and rotten potatoes, but they cut the raw out of the potatoes. And then they made like this home fries and chicken. And, um, he's like, I got, I got food for your squad, dude. And it was like the best, you know, can 
concoction of food you'd ever tasted because your body's just like <laughs> needing needing energy and nutrients and it's one thing to not eat all day it's a different thing to not eat all day and gunfight all day you know under a kit so everybody needed it and so we i was like show me the post you know why i'm down here show me show me what's up you know because i was coming down in a couple of days after that water load was done and uh so we jump up in the machine gun like the he had a 240 up there and machine gunner on the 240 and they'd already had to peel a couple dudes mopeds trying to push in the lines and and arm dudes um so we're still kitted up and i was i remember like we lit another cigarette we're uh <laughs> another newport and we're just kind of dragging on it and you see like down on the ground you see the buddies coming you know like the lance corporal buddies finding their buddies <laughs> It's just, uh, there's something else when you see, when you see grown men do that stuff. Yeah, man. man. They're just hanging on each other. And you don't, you don't find that anywhere else. Sorry. That's, it gets me. I knew. No, man. For those, for those who are listening, I'm tearing up too. Um, uh, I was going to ask. It's just one of those emotions, man. When you see it, you, you see it, you know, that's love. That's, you know, that's what we do it for. Yeah. You don't think about the national anthem and the flag and the politics, you know, you fight because of that. So Shit. that's deep. It's a, it's a powerful emotion. Is, dude. I, I wish, I wish everybody, I, I, I got asked that question on podcast before. And I said, I wish that you could bottle that up and give that and sell that to people. Cause there's not a price for it. No, it's uh it's a trust, you know, it's a trust that says, <clears throat> You said you got my back and then you just fucking killed people because they were behind me. And so that, uh, that makes the whole trust in the bond a whole lot more real. Yeah. And, and when it's like, there's only 42 of us. And when they kill all 42 of us, we don't, none of us go home, you know? So there's that, there's that gravity to it. Like every one that you lose that it says USMC on their name tape or us Marine, that's one less person, one less gun that I have to fight you tomorrow. Uh, and so that falls into it, you know, so. I, I often th- mention that there are very few things on this earth that money can't buy, but that's one of them. Like, they're not going to take some celebrity and drop them in with you. No, like, you yeah. got to earn your way there and you're not going to take some secondhand guy with you. Like, no, yeah, no matter definitely. how much money they give you. That's a fact. I think that's why they pay us like they do. It's just like no, I'm serious. It's like teachers, cops, I hear you, military, I first hear you. responders. If you put this big hundred and fifty thousand dollar paycheck on it, you're gonna be bringing a bunch of people that shouldn't be doing those jobs. Yeah, and so you leave it down, and you say the people that are supposed to do these jobs will do these jobs regardless of what we Shit. pay them because it's in them. Dude, I love that. I've never really actually thought of that, but I think it's spot on. As I, I do too. I still wish we could pay them all more because they're like teachers. First responders and military are why we have any of this that we yeah. have. Yeah. So, shit. Hey, yeah. so for people who haven't been in this environment, right? Um, I, I talked to Elliot Ackerman, you know, who was in Fallujah and just talking. Yeah, I have his book. God, uh, I have his, bo- his last he's book, great. The Fifth Act. Yeah. He, you know, he, he would talk about kind of in the lulls between combat. And I'm curious, as you describe like the nighttime, when you own the night, they're not going to mess with you after this day of fighting, you're a squad leader. What's going on for you in those couple of hours before you get some shut eye after the fighting's died down, but you still got responsibility, like give people an idea of what that's like. Yeah. Um, okay. So like, uh, during that time, the night would consist of planning the next day's operations with the Lieutenant and with the platoon Sergeant and the other, uh, your other counterpart squad leaders, you're going to, like the night of night two, somebody had spotted the land bridge with OE antennas coming out of it and stuff. So we're going to take all that information in. We're maybe going to go do a leader's reconnaissance by ourselves out, get eyes on. Yep. That's it. Yep. That lines up. That's our, that's our mission. You know, other times it would be, um, the ops are done and you're coming in to stand a four hour radio watch where you're checking in with anybody that's in or outside the wire anybody that your unit's accountable for, um, you know, and then when we get to the main run of the mill, once we have our stuff and we have a COC, then it becomes, 
you know, you get done weapons chow now you're going to pull some kind of sog sergeant of the guard where you're roving the camp to make sure the posts are good give them anything they need um well they they did a good my unit did a really good job of not overtaxing elements after we got established all the way in the beginning we had so much space that like squads were split in two and ran independently because we had to cover so much ground and that's just not normal those nights is different. You fight and then you might be a squad size element <clears throat> at an OP somewhere, which means half of your elements awake on post while the other half sleeps. So it becomes a discipline thing to say, no, you have four hours, get it right now. You you're up for four hours. Let me know if you need anything kind of thing. Um, and then we, we ran a lot of night ops too. I mean, just because we own the night doesn't mean we just stay inside and sleep. So um there were night ops all the time. And, and especially it was really creepy in the beginning because you're a squad holding a compound. And so you might have four people on post, one facing each way, Afghan army guys helping you. Um, but in the middle of the night there, the Taliban would ride in and leave night letters, what they called night letters. Um, and they left one at our neighbor's house. I was on an OP. We didn't even know somebody came through the night. And literally by neighbor, I mean, there's like a four foot alley and then their yard, their courtyard wall. So it's like grenade range from the neighbors and some Taliban came in and left them a night letter and instructions on where to place a bomb instructions about what they should do with us. And we never knew they were there. I'd never so heard they, of night letters. This is like instructions, basically do this or. Yeah. Or sometimes you like, or they call them night riders and they'd come in on their little mopeds or whatever. And they would snatch, you know, somebody's daughter and give him instructions on where to lay a bomb, you know, and he's going to go lay that bomb. And then my Lance Corporal is going to shoot him. And both of them were admirably. Um, that's, that's one, one of the th things I feared most over there. That's that yeah, scenario. Sucks. Yeah, it sucks. And they're damned if they do. They're damned if they don't. Yep. And the Taliban doesn't care. They don't care. They never did. And like one guy that helped us <clears throat> later on in Shenny Wall is helping get the water up and, uh, you know, uh, helping marine forces in open broad daylight and uh and they they came by early in the morning and and they they shot him so many times his head was gone like they blew his head off and he had seven kids no wife his kids sat there and watched that and it was like a whole ak magazine and you know our guys had to come through there and find that and that's after we told people like hey they're watching this guy they don't like that he's working with us we should do this at night kind of thing but um so they're ruthless. They ruled, they ruled that place for sure. Like the people were terrified of the Taliban. Um, how about how long was the op for you guys? How long was that squad in there for Marsha? Um, so February 13th to like middle of August, I guess. <laughs> Something like that. It was like seven months. Yeah. My, the first month was like shaping and getting ready. But so I think we deployed out of CONUS like January 2nd or 3rd. Got over, did the rigmarole. It takes like a week or so to get to where we're supposed to go. And then it was shaping for three weeks or something, maybe four weeks. And then the 13th of February. And then we pulled out. And I was, uh, at the end, I was a key leader. So the main body left and now the key leaders are staying back to do left seat, right seat transition of authority. And uh, so I think it was only like a week I had on the back end once we came out of zone, like to get everything. And then, and then maybe it was a little longer than that. Wasn't much. You mentioned, you alluded earlier to like your transition out wasn't great. And you try to, you know, that's one of the things you work on. I have to imagine that this experience for that long in a place like Marsha with that op tempo contributed to what you dealt with later. I think, uh, I think it has a lot to do with explosions um, and traumatic brain injury. The more research I've done on it, um, but losing friends is not fun. It's not easy. You don't get closure when you're in the, you know, maybe if you're in a soft element and you go home, you can be there for a funeral, but mm, that was never my experience it was you lost somebody uh they get flown out of zone when the op tempo slowed down enough you could have a memorial with you know like a pair of boots and a rifle and a sandbag um 
and then you hear about the funeral later and you hope it was good and you see the family after you know if it's in the beginning of the pump six or seven months later when they're numb to it and you're not still because you're just living it when you get back home and then oh by the way when you get home they have a real memorial service with all of them again um that yeah so that doesn't that doesn't get easy and I, I was having a conversation with some guys the other day and i said it shouldn't it shouldn't be easy because like god forbid we ever reach a time where killing is that easy yeah. where we can just go annihilate each other and nobody has any repercussions for it that would be the end of us uh, that's why i don't like the robots and the drone usage the drone doesn't have feelings you know um and I don't think we're supposed to kill each other. Uh, I'm a guy that loved doing my job. And I, my job was to kill people back in the day, you know, um, only, only ones that need it. But it, it's definitely something that'll stay with you. I never lost sleep over killing the wrong people. So, uh, you know, there were some kids that were collateral damage that jacked me up, especially on that first day. I fired a HIMAR rocket or I didn't fire I called in for a high mar rocket and marked a building wrong building got hit but at the time I was still like you know fuck there's a sniper over there he's probably in all these buildings but they had like uh, five women and seven children under the age of five in one of the buildings and so it's a mass casualty evacuation situation they come out singles doubles fire uh, and then we send a osprey a, uh, v22 mv22 osprey and our captain does to to try to help and they start launching rockets at it so we can't help them uh you know and and that's not cool uh and it's just by their bad fortune and bad luck that they were born at this time in that place that that was their childhood you know and you think about that as a as a person later on yeah um and that's that can be tough um how also, often do you think about that with your kids ryan so I'm, I'm, I've been in a lot of, I've been in a lot of therapy since all this has happened. Um, my kids are 10, eight and seven. And when they were first born, it jacked me up real bad because I never had remorse for those kids until I had kids. Like I felt bad, but it was like, ah, shouldn't have been there. Kind of felt bad. Didn't mean to. And it's just kind of the way you had to be to it at the time. Cause it's collateral damage is going to happen. We didn't see them. We took fire. People were, my guys were getting hit out of that building got to reduce a building didn't know they were in there that's a fucked up thing for somebody to even use a human shield um on all levels but uh what was the question yeah you, you hit it. it it was your kids like how, how yeah yeah how that that affected that? me it changed the way i seen everything uh changed the way i seen everything um let me ask you this ryan the so I know you, you still do more time in the Marines after this deployment, right? But you say your transition out is tough. Mm. The, the emotional challenges, whether it's the TBI or what, whatever you experience, does it happen while you're still in the Marine Corps or is it after you've gotten out and you've separated? Oh, no, very much while I was in. Uh, very much right after that deployment. I had been on five deployments, like I said, four or five deployments before that one. And never anything like that as far as you know kinetics and 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 gunplay and um but on that one like i came home and like nightmares i had never had nightmares before i started having nightmares and you could call it a nightmare or you could just call it like a, a really saucy dream where you're in combat with your buddies and your heart rates up and I wouldn't even call it a nightmare. Maybe, you know what I mean? Maybe it was a nightmare, but it definitely had physiological responses from my yeah. dreams. Um, and, um, and that was pretty immediate. And then I had un like uncontrollable emotions. Like I'm type a, I don't get sad. I don't cry. Like that's not what I do. Yeah. And I would just find myself melting for no reason or, or, or at least not an obvious, not something obvious to me. Like, and then you're like, start tasing yourself. Like, what is wrong with you? You, you know, and so that, that goes with it. Um, um, but I, a lot of guys do the same thing I did. I, I, I drank and I came home and I drank and I come from yep. a drinking culture. Um, that's a culture that needs to change. Um, 
we shouldn't be drinking like that. It shouldn't be like the tagline to every joke that we have that we're born in a bar. So we're just going to drink. No, I don't think so. I think we're better when we don't. And I think the amount of people killing themselves correlates highly with getting too intoxicated. Nobody yeah. wants to say that. Um, but I think that's true. So I took that route during transition. And, you know, one thing is it's like the only legal substance that you can use. Uh, as an active duty person, it totes a gun and it's, it's legal and, and acceptable by everybody else's standards. Even if you go out and get really shitty, you know, at the bar, get all, you know, gummed up and fuck something up. You're like, ah, she, she was just drunk, Yep. you know? So it's got that fallback to it. Um, and you know, hell, even people in our command would say, I just drink a little bit more. You'll be all right. Shit'll go away. And it's just not the answer. It's not the answer. Um, so I go hard again. I go hard against that. Cause I, you know, I spent two years of my life drinking, thinking that that was going to solve all my problems and it would just go away on, on its own. And that's not the case at all. Not the case at all. You got to talk and you got to, you got to have a purpose. Like one of the big things I talk about on my show is uh worst injury I ever had was lack of purpose. Somebody retired me, telling me I can't do that anymore. And it's all I ever wanted to or trained to to do ever. And now you tell me I can't do that anymore. Whew. What's that look like? That's bad. And then what? Right. And if you don't how, find how'd you find it, man? What my purpose? Oh man, school, going to college uh, was a big was a big uh step in the right direction. You know, I thought I'd just retire and everything was gonna be peachy. It wasn't. You know, you go from living your entire life, your entire adult life, at least in my case at 18 and on, if you're in the in the service of some kind, you have a purpose that is fixed for you and you don't realize it. So 20 years later, you get out, whether you did stuff or not, you're going to get out and you're going to feel this hole, like this void in your, in your being, like you're supposed to be doing something else. Well, that's because you, for your entire adult life, you did fulfill something that was much 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 bigger than you on, on a on a grand scale bigger than you uh and then you come out and you're not doing anything bigger than you and so what i tell guys all the time go volunteer go find something bigger than yourself go give back to the community that you come from or the service that you come from or the family that you come from and selfless acts of service serving somebody else without the the automatic um expectation of something in return um and you do that as a marine whether you as a as a service member in, in any branch when you're forward deployed or when you're training to be forward deployed you are giving a random not random you're giving a organized act of kindness and act of service to people you don't know will never know and will never know you and you know that and it seems like a small thing but then when you get out, you'll feel that void. You feel that stuckism, and uh, you got to find purpose. For me, it was, okay, I got to affect my community. How can I affect my community? I can speak and I can write to my community. Oh, and by the way, podcasts are, good, are a thing now. And it's a direct communication log from me to somebody else. So my first step was I got to finish the book. Um, and to do that, I needed to go to school because I got like, you know, like, I don't know, five chapters in and realized I'm not a writer and I need to go learn what to do. <laughs> and so I went to school. Yeah, I went to school and learned how how much I didn't know about the world. Um, and that was the start of it for me. You know, I realized that I could get good at writing. I could get good at speaking. I took speak, speech drafting and speech uh, writing and public speaking creative writing, everything to foster uh, verbal and written communication so that I could affect my, I could affect my community. And, and, and what's beautiful about that is, you know, for anybody out there listening, if you feel like you just need a starting point, just start anywhere, do your research, find a spot and go and that stuff will start to fall, you know, together. It was uh, 2015 that I decided I wanted to speak to Marines and speak to service members and launch a podcast and finish this book. I've now finished this book. I'm a year and a half in 40 episodes recorded uh, with my podcast. 
and last year got to speak and give a keynote speech to Marines uh, in the infantry battalions over on Camp Lejeune in the Raider Hall. And since then, you know, went back to speak to more Marines. So make an action plan. If it's something that you care about and it's like, it's your dream, you got to start now and you got to chase your dream because your dream's not going to turn around and chase you back and nobody else is going to do it for you. No. So yeah. got to make a plan, execute. I love it. I think a lot of people who listen to our, our show will find some, some great stuff with uh, choices, not chances as well. Oh, I hope so, so. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, there's a couple questions, Ryan, that I try to ask everybody before we wrap up. So the first one is, is there anything that you brought with you into combat that had sentimental value, something that someone else gave you that you just wanted to have with you? I took a picture of my wife. That's it. Mm -hmm. Where'd you carry it? Uh, in my Kevlar underneath my Kevlar paddings. Really? Yeah. That's cool. We have not had, <laughs> I had that it. One yet. I put it, uh, you know, like the double-sided tape that you can make kind of laminate something out of. Yep. I just double-sided it up so it could get wet and not get ruined and cut it out and put it up in my, in my Kevlar padding. Well, I lost all my hair on that deployment. So it's all in, in there with the hair. So. <laughs> so if you took your Kevlar off, you could look down and see it every time. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, I don't um, think I took anything else. Uh, you know, a lot of guys have mementos or. I that's never, a good one, man. I never took anything. Picture, yeah. one picture. And I didn't have kids at the time, you know, so. Yeah. That was one picture. One picture. And on the back of that picture was like my dad's phone, my mom's phone number, my wife's phone number. I don't have a good memory. And uh, I could keep it with me that way. So. Love it. You know. And then the, the next question is as you look back on the time that you spent in the Marines, uh, the deployments, the good and the bad and losing people the way you talked about and, you know, the injuries, TBI, would you go back and do that again? A hundred times yesterday, tomorrow, if you send me back with the same people to do the same game, look, I didn't want to get out. They wanted me to get out. I had got, you, you can read about it in the book. It, I had uh, some 82 millimeter mortars dropped on me at way too close of a range, ruptured both my eardrums. I didn't know it at the time. I knew they bled, but I didn't know anything else. And, uh, you know, come back, I'm still serving and trying to go into ANS uh, for MARSOC and had to do a special naval warfare physical where they found both my eardrums were ruptured and that I needed hearing aids and that I could no longer deploy in combat capacity and end in my career so yeah that's uh <laughs> one of those things yeah you know so believe it well ryan this is so much fun man thank you so much for taking the time i think you're gonna get some new uh some new listeners and book sales here sweet uh, really appreciate it man no i appreciate you having me on like i said humbled honored i'm always i'm always game to 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 talk to you know guys like you and i love the podcast i think your podcast is great. I've watched a lot of them and I watch a lot of podcasts trying to figure people out and, you know, tips, what can I do better? And you got a, you got a great setup. Uh, and so I appreciate having you on, or you having me on this. It's been amazing. Thanks a lot, man. I hope you all enjoyed that combat story. And I will tell you, I don't often tear up during these, but man, Ryan hit me hard on that one. Uh, just talking about those relationships and the bonds in combat. I wanted to read just a couple listener comments. These were posts on Instagram or one of the social sites after we said thank you for helping us hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is just amazing. Um, just a few of these here. Echo9 Axiom, which is our buddy Eric Miares, who we interviewed. Uh, he said, okay, well, buddy, let's get you to 1 million. Truly appreciate what you're doing. Standing by to support. He said, Joseph Lappinson said, well-deserved. Your podcast motivate me like nothing else. Bill L. TNS said, I've never listened to podcasts before discovering your channel two years ago. Thank you for the amazing content. It feels illegal to have it for free. Um, then Super Plums 1911 said, love your channel, bro. Keep up the great work. Then we had a few others on YouTube after we posted this and they said, 
Richard, this is from Richard Bowles. Um, you serve great material that everyone should see. Thanks for all you do and have done in the past. <laughs> um, Russ Cluley says, my favorite traveling YouTube channel, never travel without it. Love hearing that one. Hunter17, way to go, Ryan. How about an office tour? Looks like you, you have some cool things there. So I'm gonna do one of those for, uh, for Patreon, I think that's a great call out. I need to do that. And lastly, Jason Watts, a well-deserved brother, absolutely love the show. So just a, a few call outs there that I really do appreciate. I mean, I look at these these comments, the positive ones at least, and just a huge thanks for standing by us as we got to 100,000 and listening to interviews like this one with, with Ryan Rogers um, that I think was both funny and uh, pretty pretty touching at the same time. Thank you all, stay safe. All right, Ryan, the first one is what sights, smells, or sounds take you back to your time in combat? Definitely choppers. Um, not the whiskeys, but the x-ray cobras that chop the air real hard. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, that's one of them. And conveniently, I live right across from the air station. So it's every day they have a pattern over my house to the airport. So that, that one's uh, that one's good. But it, it not always uh, it doesn't take me back to a bad time. It takes me back to... Every time I called choppers is because I needed help and they always came and they always helped. So it's takes me back, but in a good way. Love it. Uh, also the, the smells would be, um, burning plastic, like, um, uh, wires, uh, like the insulation for wires and, uh, short little kindling sticks, you know, like I told, told you in the podcast, uh, poppy, they would cook their tea and stuff with that. And when that hits me and they say that the old factory bulb, your sensory, uh, for smell uh, is real up high in your brain and, and they say that's why it takes you back um more so with a smell than with with other things yeah that makes total sense yeah okay um and we did not pay you to say that about choppers but i love it no no so, <laughs> ne next one is uh what's one of the funniest things you can remember from your time downrange there's can i tell you can i tell you two hell yeah all right. So the first one is a, is a sick, gross prank that a lot of people won't appreciate. But if you've been in and you know kind of how the, how the grunts work, it, it could be funny, I suppose. So we're in the push and, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 days in, 20 days in. It's not a lot. We've lost some guys already. We've killed a lot of people. And it's just like our, you know, wash, rinse, repeat cycle of going, you know, go on patrol, come back, get up for post. If you're a junior guy, go stay in your post, come back, go to sleep, get up, go patrol constant cycle we didn't have gatorades um, or powerades we had water and we didn't have a lot of water all the time but at that point we had a lot of water enough water but somebody had gotten a case of gatorades i don't know if it's in the mail or if one of the trucks dropped them off to us or whatever and we were down to one last gatorade and we had made some like hesco furniture out of the hesco uh barriers like that you put sand in so we're all like smoking and joking we made like a little NCO chill area. So there's a bunch of corporals and, and, you know, sergeants and team leaders and squad leaders. All the guys are either asleep or on the post and the junior guys. Well, my guys is turned to go on post mini me guy named Alpha Rod Bright. And, uh, and Michael Grimes called him lunchbox. He's a fluffy Marine. And, uh, so I go wake him up and I'm like, Hey, you got post in 10 minutes. Make sure you get up, get out here, you know, top off your water you know all the things you say all the things and so i go back over to like the chill area well in that area there was a half drink gatorade and it was the last gatorade on the cop and uh like we're all just in casual conversation and one of the corporal team leaders picks it up unscrews a cap drops trowel <laughs> like blows air into this bottle twists the cap back on and like throws it to the next guy and like clockwork without missing a beat, everybody in conversations just goes around and there's like five of us. It goes around the circle, twist it back on, give it a good shake and put it back up on that table. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> here come my two Marines, diddy bopping out, getting ready for post and Wright's like, all right, Sergeant, I'm going. And he like, you know, he goes and heads to post. He's all grumpy when he wakes up. And Michael Grimes comes out and he's, <laughs> I can't say it without laughing to this day, but he's fully kitted up, you know, and like I said, he's a little fluffier and he's my com comedic relief for the squad. He's that one guy. He's the guy that trolls everybody. Like he was sitting there in a deep religious talk and he's the guy that walks up and he's like, God's not real faggots, you know, something like that. And you're like, ah, he's that guy. 
And uh, he walks out and he's like, yo, sir, we got any Gatorade left? <laughs> and I grabbed that Gatorade and I chucked it over there to him. Boom, he catches it. I said, it's the last one. You better enjoy that one. And he's like, nah, thanks, Sergeant. Well, I thought he was going to like put it in his drop pouch, disappear to post, ration it out. It was the last one. And I wouldn't get to see the fruits of our labor. Instead, what happens is he catches that bottle. He's like, thanks, Sergeant. And like, doesn't even give himself time. Like, unscrews it and upends it and slams the whole uh. thing. And we're all biting our lips like, mm. And he's like not paying attention. He's like slams the whole thing, go, go, go. Comes down and twists the cap back on. He's like, that tastes like shit. <laughs> <laughs> he drank the whole thing, Ryan. Well, there was only like half of it left. Oh, Jesus. And uh, oh. he said, that tastes like shit. And we're, bah! everybody falls off of the <laughs> off of the couch. And he just puts, drops his head, turns around and walks to post like, oh, no. <laughs> Um, oh, so that it. was funny. The other funny thing is probably funnier to any of you officers out there that were part of the <laughs> command staff. It'd probably be really funny to you. Um, we started getting these nipper messages over over the gear from the battalion sergeant major. Um, these are like emails, right? Nipper is like a yeah, yeah, yeah secure class email. Yeah, it's a secured unclass secured. email. Okay. And uh Here's somebody. I don't, did you ever use a wag bag? No. You know what that is? Okay. No, so over there, they it. would build like the shitters. Well, once everybody figured out standing over top of a barrel of shit and diesel fuel was killing people or hurting their lungs, they started sending these wag bags over. So you'd have like a porter shitter. And you know how they used to cut the bottoms of them off and have hinges uh -huh. where you could slide the barrel in? They still they didn't have any hinges because there's no barrel. Now you had like a bag that secured to your like it secures to the toilet seat right and then the bag drops down and there's like kitty litter in the bottom of it so you do your business and you tie the bag up and you go throw it in a burn pit or in a trash pit and it, it's a whole lot better i guess the problem is the all those holes were cut like barrels were going in there so when you're walking by like the shitting area there's a bunch of shitters lined up and you can see which one's occupied because there'd be a, a bag hanging there. Well, apparently somebody, and I've never found out who I would love you to contact my podcast. If you do know who, or if you were that person, <laughs> but somebody was finding the Sergeant major when he was shitting at night and they would go up and pop that wag bag up, <laughs> up into, <laughs> up into it. And, uh, and, and then we didn't just get one of these nasty grams through nipper. Like this happened several times. <laughs> So it was somebody definitely a boss that was uh, <laughs> like a guy that has to have a car seat and put his balls in when he gets in the car to secure them because I, I don't know how you do that so many times and get away with it. And if he'd have got caught, the sergeant major was so bad, oh. I think it would have been over for him. He's just probably like the BC, like the battalion commander didn't like him or something. <laughs> Yeah, oh, we got three. Great. We got three of those messages, so I don't know how many times it happened, but I know it was at least three. Oh Jesus! All right, that's great. Um, what advice would you give to an eighteen to twenty-two year old who's thinking about joining the military? I would say you need to watch all the podcasts and read all the books pertaining to the job setting to which you want to walk into. There's a wealth of information yeah. in your phones, on YouTube, on podcasts, on Spotify, on written books, on audio books. And it's something that Marines don't, in my experience, Marines and warfighters didn't do a lot of. Um, and it's paramount because if you read 10 books about being a Marine special operator, you're going to have a wealth of information. Then when you get to where you're a Marine special operator, and you have those situations come up, you're pulling from a bank of lived yeah. experience, of learned experience. Ryan Holiday is, uh, he writes about the Stoics, uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, and, he's great. And from him, I learned, you know, it doesn't matter if I lived it or if you lived it, as long as I understand your experience, I can then be better at it in the future. So if me and you were both given um, 100 pipe cleaners and one ping pong ball and a box of toothpicks, and I told you, somebody told us, make a ramp that will move that ball from this side of the table to that side of the table. You have 10 minutes, go. And they started it. 
Most people fail that. But if I show you one person, one time on YouTube, do that with the same materials, you'll do it in two minutes. You do it in two minutes. And that's the point. The point is, there's so many things that because of the geographical and geopolitical situation on the planet right now, you can't have these experiences. You just can't have them. But you can go read about them. You can learn about them. You can watch people talk about them. That way, when those experiences in the Pacific coming up for whoever's going to go there next, you should know a lot about the Pacific. You shouldn't join a service branch unless you are fully committed to it. If you're an 18 to 22 year old person that just doesn't know what you want to do with life and maybe I'll just go to the Marine Corps for the paycheck, man, I think you're going to bite off a lot more than you want to yeah. chew on. Not more than you can chew because you can chew it, but more than you want to chew. It takes, it takes that person that wants to be there, in my opinion. And I want the guy who wants to be here. I don't want the guy that was court ordered to be here. You know, I don't want the, the dropout that hadn't gotten anything no. else going for him. I want the guy who wants to be here. If you're that guy, I want you to go to the recruiting office right now and, and sign up. Yeah. Um, if you're I, not that guy, find another path. Man, I, I will say you are spot on in terms of like doing your homework and read, like there's so much info out there. And I was guilty of this. I loved history, military history. Like I read it, but I would kill to go back and have a oh. hundred interviews with vets like I have now in my head oh, and man. what, like just pull little bits from each of them. hundred percent. I kill for that. hundred percent. Me too. I, uh, I, I talk to guys now and say, I'm more, I'm better prepared to go fight a fight in combat yeah. now than I ever thought about being at 24. Yeah. If my it's body crazy. would keep up, I, you know, so if we can get the 24 year olds doing all of this, exactly, like the 22 man. year olds doing all of this, Man, that'll be a force to reckon with. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Last one here. Best piece of advice you received during your career. So what? Best piece of advice I ever got was, so what? Um, you have a situation still, and it's not going anywhere by itself. And uh, that's for combat. And life, huh, it's hard to say one good piece of advice to me. There's so many pieces of advice that helped shape me and it wasn't just one but i would say that um the one that i've been steadily passing on uh the last couple of years is that you know nobody is coming to save you period nobody and once your dad dies that's the last test of becoming a man and there is no safety net a lot of you don't have a safety net anyway Nobody's coming to save you and your dreams don't chase you back. So if you want to do something, you need to decide now, boom, I'm doing this. I'm making an action plan and I'm putting my foot on the gas. I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson. And he'll say that, what do you have? 70 good years. You have 70 good years. I'm 36. So I have 35 more good years that I can influence people, show love, kindness, and, and pass on the knowledge that I have. Nobody's going to listen to me if I don't get my shit together. Some people spend 20 years getting their shit together. You don't have 20 years to get your shit together. You need to start right now. And it doesn't matter if you're 50 or if you're 21, 18, get your shit together now. Read, research, pick your path, have a, have a plan, an action plan, develop it, five good points, aim at what you want to be, and then don't look up for a couple years. And you don't want to hear that at 21. You want to go party yeah. and you got friends and you got all these things, but I promise you, if you do that now, when you look up in three years at 24, you will be set. You will learn. You will have learned enough to be proficient and efficient at everything that you do yeah. in your in your vein. Um, so nobody's coming to save you. Own that. Understand that. And, and what we, we don't get out of this alive. We're all going to die at the end of this. So you might as well enjoy the, the ride and stop betting on the come. Yeah. Enjoy what you're doing. If, <laughs> if you don't feel that heartthrob of every day getting up to do whatever it is that you got planned, then maybe you're in the wrong profession. I tell people all the time we have a depressed country 80% of the time because 90% of our American population are in dead-end jobs that they were using as a stepping stone and they got caught, caught up and uh, become a slave to the system. And now they're watching 10% of us live our dreams yeah. and have sheer bliss and happiness on our face and every day they're going to something no wonder you sleep in and hit the snooze you hate what you do 
don't hate what you do. And if you hate what you do, leave the shore. Don't be afraid to put a plan together and leave that. Go find what you love. It'd be easier. Awesome. Love it.